one of the things that we would like to do is we'll have to postpone all the actions on this current agenda for a future agenda. Next Tuesday at 7.30 rather than 7 o'clock is the council organizational meeting. Um, the county board of canvassers certified the election. So we are good to go with um, swearing in the new 6th district um, <coughs> representative Mark Wickliffe, and Mark is here today, uh, next Tuesday at 7.30. Um, traditionally, we will hold, we'll be, we'll be electing the mayor, mayor pro tem, going over guidelines, council guidelines, as well as asking council to review the um, cal their annual calendar for the next year coming up. Um, the next meeting after that will be, I believe, the 19th. The 19th, and we'll have to carry all of these items over on to the 19th for that particular meeting. Um, we would ask, this evening we were going to ask council to amend the agenda to allow a presentation to be made. Uh, the presentation will be made by the DPW Director Jeff Lapula and Sean Middleton, the engineer of record on sanitary sewer evaluation study, SSES. You've heard us talk about that for the past year, as well as the SAW grant application. Um, in light of other things being on the agenda this evening, uh, we would still like to make that presentation uh, with Mr. Whitliffe here this afternoon or this evening. That will give us four council members that will have seen this presentation uh, on the 19th for that particular process. So with your permission, we'd like to move forward with that presentation. Good evening. Uh, before you, we've got a, uh, what I believe is a real opportunity for the city of Manistee. As you're aware, in 2011, the city of Manistee made an application for an S-2 grant from the Department of Environmental Quality. That S-2 grant was set up, our application was set up, to complete a sanitary sewer evaluation study. And the intent of that was to look at all the places in the city of Manistee where stormwater was entering our system. And during uh, storm events, during spring thaws, we were, we were having too much flow get to the plant. Give just a little bit of background. Uh, the city of ASD had, had a combined sewer system, and with the completion of Jones Street in 2010 and the Cedar Street separation project in 2011, we now have a completely separated system. However, we still maintain one combined sewer overflow, which is located at, at Fifth Street and Ramsell Street. So, I'm going to show you a slide of a typical flow at the treatment plant. And on this day, which was just last week, if you look at the screen, the flows get real low. This is starting at 6 in the morning. As people get up and start making breakfast and getting off to work, the flows come up. They hit a peak around noon and then tail off. And then after the dinner time period and, and after the evening, those flows typically uh, head back down. And this, this process repeats itself on a daily basis. This was on Sunday, October 27th, so just about a week ago. On Thursday, this was Halloween, the flows started out at 6 o'clock in the morning, back down at their normal point, but as soon as it started raining, you see that the flows spiked up from starting at below half a million gallons per day to up over one and a half million gallons per day, leveled out because the rain continued all day, and then later in the evening it spiked up to over three million gallons per day. I'll explain this abrupt uh, reduction here in a second. <coughs> Still battling the, uh, the Manistee cold, so my voice will give out a little bit. The treatment plant is designed to handle 1.3 million gallons per day on a daily basis. We can handle flows of about 1.6 or 1.7 for intermediate, intermediate, intermediate periods of time, usually in the five to six hours a day, if we make adjustments to how the process is working. Hydraulically, we can go above that 
into the 2 million gallons a day. But once we get above that 2 million spike, like we did here, the 2 million is right in this area, we physically have to close down a gate which, which shuts down and restricts the flow that comes into the plant. When that happens, the gate restricts that flow down to about that 1.6, 1.7 range, and we can do short periods of treatment at that time until we break the flows. What happens is that sewage backs up into the systems, backs up into the, our interceptor sewer, <clears throat> and if it gets high enough, it will actually top a weir at the location of Fifth and Ramsville and will get discharged into our storm sewer system and eventually out to Manistee Lake. That actually happened today with the amount of rain that we had today. With our NPDES permit, the, the permit that allows us to operate the plant and to create a, and discharge water into Manistee Lake, we are required to remove that combined sewer overflow at Fifth and Ramsdale by the year 2016. It's the end of that year, but there are milestone dates that force us to begin that planning and design earlier in 2016. So in order to do that, we had to do a study to determine where is that water coming from, and once we determine where it's coming from, if possible, how do we handle that? Uh, and this is just another example of a daily, daily flow, flow rate and then impacted by a storm. So the sanitary sewer evaluation study was in the neighborhood of $227,000 total. The, D, the S2 grant covered 90% of that cost, so the city was responsible for 10%. So since that time, Adam Marsh has been working on um, completely evaluating all of our structures, the previous bulkheads in our uh, old CSO uh, crossovers. They've been doing flow monitoring, they've been doing some modeling, smoke testing, dye testing. Um, they have, they have completed a draft copy of, of this report, which is the actual sanitary sewer evaluation study. Right now, this is in, in a draft format. We've marked it up, we've had our current engineers go through it, and so Ad Marsh is working to complete that. If you see on the screen, the dates that we have to, uh, that we're required to get the final uh, CSO closure begins in Ju June 1st of 2015 and then continues on until construction is completed by the end of 16. This plan also serves as our ability to borrow low interest loans through the state revolving fund and uh, that work, the, the recommendations of this, print, of this plan have to be implemented within three years after the, the grant is finalized. So we need to come up with our next step. And there will be public hearings on this plan that will be scheduled uh, in the very near future as that gets completed. But we've, uh, the state of Michigan has actually given or put out a new grant program and the applications for that just came out last month. And so we've been working with our current engineer, Spicer Group, to put together that grant application. And so Sean Middleton is going to uh, walk us through what that SAW grant process is. Do, is there any questions on the, what Jeff has presented? So, I mean, there's a lot of slides. I hate for you to miss any questions you might have on those first slides coming up. We can always come back to them also. Okay. I just thought maybe Councilman Cody had a question there. I knew it was not right now. Okay. I just thought I noticed that. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Good evening. Again, my name is Sean Middleton. I'm with Spicer Group. And I guess uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of briefly give an overview of the saw, the saw grain application and then get into some of the specifics of where the city of Manistee may be able to utilize uh, some of the grain eligible activities and work through the costs and um, ultimately in the end talk about you know, what are the strings or some of the catches that come along with this grant because uh, not, not every lunch is free egg. Um, so first of all, Stormwater Asset Management and Wastewater, SAW, the initials for SAW, is a grant that just came out from the DEQ, and within the application, they define the intent of the SAW grant program is to accelerate the statewide use of asset management planning practices, as well as improve water quality. That's kind of their underlying theme of this grant. It was a bond that was approved in 2002 for $450 million that's been allocated to this grant program. In two, in 
this fiscal year, there's $97 million that are going to be available. Um, as Jeff mentioned, the applications were released October 21st, so fairly recently. Uh, they did have some draft applications before that. We've had an opportunity to kind of work through, but the actual the formal final ap grant application in its final form was released uh, not too long ago. The grant ap applications are due December 2nd, at least the first round of those applications. And this grant system is very unique in the fact that it's first come, first serve. There's no scoring criteria. There's not the typical S2 process. This is uh, literally a first come, first serve basis grant. And initially what they pictured happening was as communities applied for the grant, they would, they would allocate the dollars and um, as you submitted, you would be in line to get those funds. What most people believe now is because there's a very uh, long list of communities that are applying for these SAW grants and everybody will be shooting to meet this December 2nd deadline, they believe that the reality is they'll have more than $97 million worth of applications or uh, grant applications. So uh, our understanding from what we're hearing from the MDQ is that they're actually gonna go to a lottery system. And so they will take all the grants that were submitted before on December 2nd and then literally go to a lottery system on these uh, applications. And then once you're in future years, uh, the 2015 fiscal year, uh, you will continue to be in the system, and if they have to go to a ladder again, you'll be in the pot to be drawn out of it, or you'll be next in line for the 2015. There actually has been some discussion that the full $457 million could be asked for in the first round. Uh, just a couple items. With the grant applications for that lottery or for being first in line, they talk about a complete application and they're not doing reviews of grant applications, but they're at their, um, we have been making a lot of phone calls to them to get some questions answered. We're looking at a 120 day review period. And so really if, if the city of Manistee was awarded the grant, they would, would be looking at April 2014 before any disbursements or reimbursement requests could be made. You can submit any time after December 2nd, and they do accordingly. So if, uh, if, if this grant wasn't submitted by December 2nd, you could look at three months, every three months, uh, an opportunity to resubmit. That kind of comes into play for some loans for construction or other grant opportunities if the money's still available down the road. So it's a grant and loan program. Uh, under the grant program, there's basically five major categories. There's planning and design of wastewater facilities, uh, development of stormwater management plans, development of wastewater and stormwater asset management plans, and testing and, and, demonstrative, and demonstration of innovative technology. And I've highlighted just two real areas that I think Manistee can apply for. It's the planning and design. A lot of those items that Jeff just talked about for the SS, as recommended in the SSCS study, and then the asset management. Uh, components of the grant. Uh, there is loan monies available uh, if there's a construction project and as of right now those construction projects are going to have been listed in an existing asset management plan or a stormwater management plan which is, the city of Manistee currently doesn't have those listed. Um, you would actually be looking at SRF monies for doing your construction and taking loans through that program. Uh, one note is these grant, uh, the grant eligible items are retroactive to January 3rd of 2013. So uh, the, some work that I'm aware of, some GIS work the city has done, could potentially, could potentially be reimbursed uh, that, for work you've done in the last year. Some of the requirements, there's a $2 million cap for grantee. Uh, the match on it is 90% to the state, 10% local match. If you are... Um, if you're, if you're not considered a disadvantaged community, on the and that's on the first million dollars. On the second million dollars, it's a 75-25 match. If you're a disadvantaged community, and we'll speak more of this a little later, uh, basically there's no match. And so we have made some submittals to the MDQ on that, and as of right now, it's our understanding that actually Manistee would be listed as a disadvantaged community. And I'll explain the reasons for that in a, in a slide coming up. So specific to the city of Manistee, what we've been talking with the city staff about is basically three primary areas. 
of looking at this grant, uh, grant eligible activities that we could look into. The first one is in this planning and design arena. Uh, basically, a lot of the items Jeff just talked about, there's approximately 70 loca inflow uh, locations identified in that report. There's another 50 storm sewer structures or uh, catch bases that have been disconnected, but still are in our need of identifying a proper outlet for stormwater. So about 120 locations that need to be looked at and identified how to make these disconnections, uh, get some design, maybe some simple plans that either the DPW or a contractor could uh, uh, make these you know, disconnections at. There's also the, the component of evaluating an equalization basin uh, in that study. And right now, it's laid out that if we go through and do these inflow, we eliminate the inflows throughout the system, go, uh, we need to go back, evaluate whether or not an equalization basin would be required. And as part of that evaluation, if one is required, how large would that basin be? And the grant also identifies that a, uh, a basis of design and a preliminary uh, engineering work needs to be completed. That would all be part of a study that would be done after some of those inflow sources are eliminated or possibly during it. And then finally, if there was a, if a CSO or an equalization basis is required, there's the design components of that equalization basin that's grant eligible. And then ultimately, if that's in place, the elimination of that CSO number 18 that Jeff was talking about. Those are all design components. Those are not construction components. The second two items are asset management um, for your system. And that is both for wastewater and for stormwater. And the city has approximately 50 miles of sanitary sewer, uh, probably on the order of 1,000 structures. There's probably, we're estimating about 30 miles of storm sewer and uh, similar numbers in catch basins and, and uh, manholes for that system. In the details, exactly what that would be is really what part of the asset management would be, is to identify all your assets and get a handle on where they are and how, um, how many of those you have. But it's a very, you know, to put that in perspective, that's 254,000 feet of sanitary and 158,000 feet of storm sewer. There's a lot of, a lot of infrastructure uh, that needs to be looked at. So the asset management planning process, uh, the DEQ um, has, makes a statement, it is the active practice of managing, operating, maintaining, and upgrading the physical assets of an enterprise to achieve the maximum benefit from that asset while providing the desired level of service. Now it's part of an MDQ pr presentation. A key point to be made, at least on the wastewater side, is there's gonna be, um, you're currently working on an NPDES permit, and that's gonna come due on October 1st of 2015. The new permits, and we've seen copies of them, will be requiring asset management. So the, the very thing this grant is providing funding for in the future will be required as part of, at least on the wastewater side, as part of your NPDES permit. Um, I think, you know, kind of the carrot and the stick a little bit approach there. They're offering a chance to do the work now. If you don't do it, they're going to be requiring it in the future. So the, both the EPA and the DEQ have basically adopted five different areas for asset management. And these, I'm going to go through them as uh, both of wastewater and stormwater kind of combined. There's some unique things with each one, but in general, they're pretty much the same process. And so what I'd like to do is just right now is kind of move quickly through these five items. And I'm going to give some slides. They're going to have really a lot of words and detail on them, and I'm not going to go into those. But it's really there to just de demonstrate the kind of level of detail that would go into an asset management plan and the amount of effort that will have to go into the asset management plan. So those items are asset inventory and condition assessment, identifying the level of service, the criticality of the assets, and I'll explain what that is, operation and maintenance strategies, revenue structure, and then finally kind of the end product is long, looking at long-term funding and, that's, and a capital improvement plan for those uh, particular um, utilities. So the inventory and condition assessment, and again, keeping in mind, you have over 80 miles of infrastructure and 
uh, literally thousands of uh, manholes and catch basins in play. They're, the, the intention here is to basically get a handle on what you own and what your assets are. And so we'd go through the process and we'd use consultants and subcontractors to assist in this work. Basically go through the process of surveying, identifying all the assets, getting them into a GIS database, evaluating the condition of those systems. And to do that, we would be using uh, video camera of all of the, your entire system. We'd clean out all this all the storm sewers, all the sanitary sewers, videotape all the storm sewers and sanitary sewers. And then there's a rating system, it's an industry standard that DEQ requires, it's called PACP. It's where you rate your pipes condition very similar to your PASER ratings that you do on the road. So there'll be a number uh, assigned to each run of pipe and each manhole. And so we would uh, basically subcontract the work and the end product would be the videotaping, um, of the manholes and the, and the pipes and a rating of those structures. In addition to that, um, we would basically create a system to, uh, to look at those conditions and to be able to kind of demonstrate that in a GIS format so you could easily see it in a graphical format for presenting at uh, meetings. And it, again, similar to PASER, similar to your roads, uh, which you're probably more familiar with. On the GIS side, and we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, you can purchase equipment, software, hardware, and training. And um, so we have, that is kind of built in to this right now, the specifics of that we still need to work through with the, um, with the city and their consultant they've been using for GIS, Info Geographics. Uh, just a little snapshot of the GIS system you currently have. Um, we. Basically, there's 22 miles of water that have been input into the system, 16 miles of sanitary, uh, 10 miles of storm sewer, and the 20 to 45 percent range of the, of the entire utility. So, uh, the good news is there's a base that's been started, and um, and I think it's a very good framework to start from. We don't we don't see recreating the wheel on anything. We'd be working from this. One of the things that may happen is. Uh, the location of structures are at uh, sub-meter accuracy, so they're kind of in a, a window of three to four feet. Uh, those could likely be tied down tighter with um, uh, the survey that's part of the, um, the grant process. And so they could be simply moved to a little tighter location. But it's a very good framework to start from. Um, this is just a snapshot of one particular uh, attribute table for a pipe. Uh, another thing the grant uh, eligible item is, is we can complete some of these fields that are incomplete. So on here is a condition, it says unknown, there's in-grid elevations, all the data can be collected. There's asset inventory and condition that can be applied to the wastewater treatment plan, all the major components. Uh, this isn't really looking at the process, this is looking at the maintenance, life cycles, uh, O&M on the system. Level of service. Uh, Really the key thing here is on the wastewater side, a lot of that is defined by the state. And what I mean by level of service is what level you're protecting against or your system is being designed against. So a 25 year, 24 hour rainfall event, what is the impacts can your system hand, handle? That would be a level of service decision that's being made. And the minimum threshold is state requirements and then discussions could, get, could be had with the council, with the city staff to determine is there any movement on that level of service? And that really comes into play in the storm sewer side, where there isn't any state laws governing what your level of service is. And it's a very, very important discussion because that is going to be a very, uh, uh, will drive costs. So if the city decides they want to have a protection of a 10 year level of service, then, you know, that's, uh, to meet that, you know, that goal, you may have to invest and maybe you're willing to accept a little lower level of service and educate the public on it. And it's just basically a balance of costs and, and um, you know, benefits and costs that you can go through. Criticality of assets, um, again, I'm not gonna go through these, but what this is, is once we know the condition of the system, that's one thing. So we can tell where all the poor pipes are, but we really don't know how important they are in the overall system. And just as an example, you know, uh, an intercept main that fails near the treatment plant is a lot more critical than an end of run 
uh, collector pipe in the top end of the system. And so with the, a big part of this analysis is, is weighing the condition against how critical it is. And you literally multiply the two together to come up with this criticality factor that says, okay, it may be in fairly good condition, it's a medium, you know, it's a medium condition pipe, but it's very critical. So maybe it's more important to keep your focus on that pipe than it is even on a poor pipe that's, you know, only serving a very small part of the city. So it kind of helps you to weigh where to put your funding, what's important, what's the highest risk, what's the uh, greatest impacts, cost environmentally, uh, financially, if something were to fail. A pump station typically is high in that criticality list because it serves a large area. The other part of this is the, the grant will fund modeling of your system, which uh, is a very, uh, again, there's a lot of uh, great opportunities to do this work, but there's, uh, it will fund modeling of your entire system where you can actually evaluate capacities, determine how the system you know, uh, works in different areas, where the bottlenecks are. A lot of that's been done with the CSO work, but again, there's a lot, a lot of part of your uh, systems that haven't been looked at. And this is an opportunity to create that model for the entire system. This is just a sample of GIS output. It could, it could represent anything. This uh, particular one is looking at hydraulic capacities uh, compared against some level of service criteria again, where you can define where are your, you know where are your, your problem areas hydraulically. The same map could be showing condition, the same map could be showing criticality. It could be showing a lot of different things, all a product of getting these assets inventory in the GIS database. O&M strategies, revenue structure, um, you know, basically working with city staff on current O&M practices, uh, identifying if there's any alternatives, uh, really looking into risk um, with O&M, you know, if there's areas that aren't maintained, what, are, what happens if a failure were to occur, um, what are the response plans to that, uh, that all becomes part of the asset management. And finally, where you end up is with a uh, capital improvement plan. And they list a 20-year capital improvement plan. I know the city has a five-year plan. Obviously, you could pull that component out to work with the overall plan. Um, and we would work with, really, the city and their, their consultants uh, that we're currently looking at for water rate studies and or sewer rate studies. And in the end, um, we'd be evaluating what is if you have the entire system, you have a level of service identified, you know the condition, the critical components, what is a plan to, to <coughs> maintain that system over the long haul and does your rates, do your rates fund that, are they able to fund that? And it's very, very important working very closely with the city on identifying what are these projects, how, you know, what, how significant are, is the, the problems with it for the system, do we really need to identify it? But in the end, we're going to be weighing Costs, rate, stu rate structure versus a 20 year plan. And obviously, that'll be an ongoing process. We'll work with the city staff, committee, city council, and the public. On the GIS side, I mentioned earlier, a uh, community inside of the size of the city of Manistee can, get, can um, ask for up to $85,000 in GIS equipment, hardware, software, and training. And since the city already has a GIS system, you need to provide justification for that, and we can we can work with city staff and Info Geographics to I think to come up with that. Um, whether we ask for the full eighty thousand dollars, I'm not sure. We really got to work that out, but that is uh, that is your limits as to what you could ask for. So the overall cost, um, we've gone through on a very preliminary basis. Uh, looked at the cost of doing these three major items, the design component, asset management for wastewater, and asset management for stormwater. And a good, good chunk of that is the subcontractor work, subcontractor work with videotaping, uh, subconsultant work, GIS, probably some local survey assistance, um, rate studies, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the equipment and training with GIS. It's a little hard to read, but um, so on a preliminary basis, we've estimated on the item number one, A, uh, wastewater planning and design activities for the 120 approximate locations 
there'd be probably $100,000 potentially worth of design work. That's about $800 of structure. So we're not looking at very intense design. It's looking at the structure, it's taking a photo, it's laying out a plan sheet, um, and getting that to the DPW and to uh, contractors and needed. From the SES study, um, they identified uh, a study to look in the equalization base, and that was budgeted at $50,000. That seems to be in the right range. That would also address some of the studies required uh, by the permit that you're currently working under. The basin, we budgeted $100,000 uh, for that work. Um, it's kind of an unknown because we really don't know how big or if, if, the, if the basin's even needed at all. That has to be studied for determined. But to budget for it, we put that in there and we'd have to work through the DEQ on what would happen if we didn't need a basin. Um, it's worth noting that uh, this is a reimbursement grant program, and so they're not gonna write a check up front. You said, you know, you're gonna submit as you go, so you're only gonna be reimbursed for what you do. Uh, the asset management, um, <coughs> there's, there's all the components, we've kind of broken those down, but really a, a good portion, almost half the cost is really with the videotape, cleaning the sewers out, videotaping them, and getting them assessed. All the other components, the modeling, the surveying, cover the other half. It works out to about three bucks a foot, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot when you have 264,000 feet. We're looking at $800,000 to do that work. Um, again, you know, this is everything that was outlined earlier and eligible in the program. In stormwater, similarly, there's only 30 miles. We're looking again about three dollars a foot, half of that being the videotaping costs. And outside of those costs are, as I mentioned earlier, we've put in uh, some costs for hardware, software, and GIS training. That could be probably scaled back. We need to work through that. Um, another component I kind of skipped over, there's force account work. There's a lot of work that the city staff can do that can be reimbursed for, including meeting times, uh, work in the field. And I need to work you know, with the DPW a little bit to see if we're in the ballpark and where those numbers should be. But um, but I think this is a frame, at least a ballpark of what these costs would be at. Match requirements, as I mentioned earlier, if you're non disadvantaged, the city would be looking at about $267,000 a match for that full scope of work if you were to do every piece of that. We talked to the MDQ last, a couple weeks ago, we sent um, a form in, the disadvantaged worksheet form and fill that out, and they have three criteria for identifying disadvantage. The first two, City of Manistee did not meet, and the third one is a little unique in the fact that it's based upon your current annual o &M costs and your current annualized debt, or your current annual debt costs. The combination of those two divided by your REUs is compared to the median household income. And the bottom line is we, we received an email back from the DQ stating that uh, Manistee is listed as disadvantaged for those reasons. And it's, that's preliminary, and when we submit the grant, we'll know uh, for sure. But the way that the numbers were, it's, we're actually not on the edge. We're fairly solid in there, so there's no guarantees, but it looks like there's a, uh, a real opportunity that this would be a 0% match uh, for the city manager. So it's um, a very unique situation. So, but with every grant, there, come, there is strings that is, I think we definitely need to talk about. Uh, on the design project side, um, basically for the design grants, you need to construct a project within three years of doing, getting the grant awarded. In your case, your permit is requiring you to do that anyway, so it's probably really not a big deal. Um, but that's, they're gonna expect that for all the design work, those projects will be built within three years, or at least begin construction within three years. And there's milestones in between, like Jeff mentioned on the other grant. On the asset management planning side, uh, starting with the wastewater, basically they, they, they defined their expectation as you're required to make significant progress toward a funding structure within three years. And a lot of questions were asked, well, what does that mean? And they finally basically def defined that as if you look at your wastewater rates and your costs and you have a gap in your funding, they expect you to, to work to develop a five-year plan to close that gap, and within three years to cover 10% of that gap. So, and that's assuming you have a gap. That's the key statement there. 
and you may not have a gap at all, you may not need to do it at all, but if you do, that is what their criteria is for um, you know, basically meeting the guidelines of the grant. On the stormwater side, since there is no rate structure, it's uh, a little vague, but basically what they say is you must implement, implement your plan within three years, so basically you should have your asset management plan com completed. And a funding structure is not required, but they do want you to show, you know, what are, do you have some critical components that need work on? They want to see that on paper that you've identified um, if your storm system has issues with it. Um, besides that, there's, so ultimately to apply for this grant, a resolution needs to be passed and that was one of the reasons we wanted to have this meeting to educate the council first on um, the background of this grant. We can provide, we will provide a lot more information to, to council. But uh, to submit, we'd ultimately have to have a resolution passed by council, and that was tentatively discussed for maybe on the November 19th agenda. Um, there's some other requirements. Most of those will be working with city staff and preparing, but uh, the SRF project plan needs to be submitted, and it's listed as an approvable plan, plan not an approved plan. So the plan is uh, near completion. Um, they do still need to go through the public uh, hearing process, but we will be able to submit that plan as it is, and then they'll be working towards approval of that. So uh, we're comfortable with that document uh, supporting this grant application. And then there's some other language and things we need to do as part of uh, supporting the grant. And uh, with that, open back to questions. So the bottom line is we have to, for this sewer project, it has to be completed or it has to be done by 2016. Is that correct? For the, when you say the sewer project, the, the, uh, the items identified yeah. in the SSES study? Yeah. Yes. Uh, on two fronts, on the on your um, your permit, as well as if you didn't get the grant, you have to done, have that work done within three years, or at least started within three years. And it's required by the state? Oh, yes. There, there's, yeah. the closure of the CSO 18 is required by our current permit in 2016. Yeah. Right. One of the grant requirements of our S2 grant is also that the results of that grant be uh, implemented within the three years, similar to this. So we've already committed to doing that, and we committed to doing it because we are permitted or we're required by permit to do it anyway. Right. So this grant would help us help us determine how much we need to do and how we need to finish solving this issue and it would pay for the design component of that. We will still have to fund the construction. The other thing is the asset management is not required under our current permit, but in 2015, they've already notified us that it will be. So this grant is also an opportunity for us to do all of that homework and all of that data logging ahead of time and be ahead of the curve on tap. Thank you. I'm not, what, what's your, um, I, I know we haven't done the plan yet, but do you have a, an idea of what kind of construction cost that we may be looking at? And everything put together? We have a little idea, just looking into the crystal ball, but yep. everybody has a little idea of what, where we're marching down. Here's, let, me, let me break that down. Let me break this down into a, a couple short sentences. Essentially, we have found a tremendous amount of catch basins and roof drains that are tied into our system. As Evan Marsh was going through and locating those, all of the catch basins that we could, we have been disconnecting. So we've already done a huge amount of that work internally. What is left will, will be implemented in the near future or next year but there, there's no, they were not able to say that will solve your problem or not. So what the grant application includes is, let's figure out how to take those 70 structures off, structures meaning private buildings as well. Once those are off, let's see that how that affects the plan, and then we will likely have to, to design an equalization basin for the balance of that water. An equalization basin essentially takes that storm surge that I showed with the spike, and instead of sending it through the plant or backing it up into the system, it stores it in a tank. 
when the storm event is over, we then put it back through the system and we treat it. <coughs> Current estimates put that put that equalization basin at somewhere between two and ten dollars per gallon for every gallon that we need to store. And, and right now we're roughly looking at a five hundred thousand gallon tank. Where would you locate it? That's a part of the study also. Um, ideally we'd like to put it real close to the, close to the treatment plant. plant. But certainly it would need to be along the interceptor sewer, so somewhere between River Street and the plant along that interceptor. That's where it's here as a safer added back in 1970. But evidently 500,000 gallons also. Well, sure. Um, just down past Jones Street, um, actually right where the, the railroad yard is, yeah. mm -hmm. right there, um, well at that time things didn't own that. There's a little section right where I think they're little Boat drilling is right now. That used to be a field, and that's where they initially had that. Okay. That, that was 1970. The site of that has continued through every sewer study that I've read really? for the past okay. 40 years. Yeah, but another possible, you know, there, there's other properties, none that are owned by the city. We would have to do some land acquisition, so that creates that range of price from two to ten. Well, if you get your stormwater down and everything off. You could build that right out of the plant and let the 36 drop right into it. And That's possible. Would more, well, we more have to pump up or more grab the out. More clarification too, because well, never mind. So one of, one of the important things that's going to be happening is the 70 locations that have been identified in the study. We we will be sending out letters to businesses, homeowners that require them to disconnect that. We've already gone through several rounds of that. Mr. Cody went through it for, for right. decades, but we're still closing down that lift. We're still closing off that leak. Every time we can get a gallon of water off of that, it's going to save us between two and ten thousand dollars in construction costs, and certainly long term with O and M costs as well. How many do you think you have still hooked up to? Ten thousand. Oh, two and ten thousand. How many do you still think you have hooked up to? Any idea? They've identified seventy. We in the past five years we've probably taken off two hundred and fifty to three hundred of them. But there's a seventy to go yet about. Yep. Well, we did this a If if you look at and we don't have it in this presentation, but if you look at the the nature of how those spikes, the spikes used to go to the top and stay there for days. Sometimes in the spring and the fall. Yes. Yep. And they would stay there for days. Yeah. Since we since we've disconnected everything that we found to date and gone through all the letters two years ago and then separated the path the last two sewer districts, those spikes still come up, but they drop quite fa quite fast and usually our recovery time is within a day. So we've made substantial improvements, mm -hmm. substantial. Another another clarification that I that came to mind as, as Sean was talking about it. Think of the level of service for stormwater. The level of service for, of service for stormwater, what he was referring to is how big do you build the pipes to get the, the water off the roadways? Can you live with it ponding after every storm? Can you live with it ponding and then draining out in an hour, in half a day, in 10 minutes? That's really a function of how, how big the systems that you create. Our leaching structures meet our level of service I can tell you that they don't for a lot of our residents because every time it rains we take those phone calls. There's not much we can do to them. They percolate in the ground very slowly, but there's better leach basins that are out there or we could do piping structures. So part of this will be what, what is acceptable to us. Another section that, that I wanted to clarify is <clears throat> each time we've been taking off these catch basins, when we've got sand below them, we've been knocking out the bottom of those catch basins. We've been concreting them solid so that they don't go into the sanitary sewer any longer, and that water is able to seep into the ground, but they're not designed for that, so they seep slowly. So if you remember last winter, we had frozen ground, we had a lot of snow, we got a warm up and some rain, and especially on the north side, there were huge areas that were flooded and ponded. And so some of this, we tried it in the S2 grant. We tried to put money in there to help, help us figure out how to solve those problems but it was not eligible. In this grant, it would be eligible. And so that's a component as well. The real intent, uh, Council had 
and rightly so, had made some requests that we not bring items of this magnitude simply to you, make a presentation, and ask you to vote the exact same night. Um, we would have traditionally brought, the, brought this to you in a work session. However, in November, work sessions are always the organizational meeting, and the deadline for submittal of the grant is December 2nd. Um, thus, we wanted to make that presentation this evening to you, give you an opportunity to hear the presentation. If you have any follow-up questions or think about it, um, give you an opportunity to have at least a week, week and a half to ask those questions of staff uh, in order to you hopefully to um, take action to apply for the S2 grant, excuse me, the SAW grant uh, on the 19th, allowing us to um, apply for it on December 2nd. The real important factor here really is, is, the, is qualifying for the disadvantaged community status based upon our debt load and allowing us to have a 0% um, potential match towards that. That really is huge for us in moving forward with this project. Can this be submitted before December 2nd? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, everyone's probably going to be waiting in Lansing for that morning to throw it into the, the laundry desk, but that's yeah. my assumption is, is that we can submit it early. They will accept the road. They're going to take all the gate stamp December 2nd. Oh, okay. Right. So, <clears throat> so you'll be down there three, four days before standing in line? You just put the lottery system. Yeah. Yeah, did yeah. so you, yeah, you, did you understand the lottery system? Yeah, yeah. The understanding that the timing of this, a lot of this was dictated by getting enough, getting this study far enough along for us to have the information for Spicers to then Correct. work with. Also, the final application just came out, you know, within two weeks. And for me personally, we've, we've been watching the SAW grant develop for the past year. We knew it was coming. We've been talking about it. So when, when, uh, when we were going through the engineer of record selection, this was a huge component in, in finding a consultant that would align us for the best chance at getting this, this grant. Do you have any additional questions we might be able to answer? Again, I know it's a lot of information tonight. If you or if Mr. Lilith has any questions mm -hmm. uh, about that uh, over the next couple of days or a week, if you want to send those questions, just email us your questions we, per se. We, we will print out copies of that PowerPoint. We'll get that too. Yeah, right. so that everybody has them. What we'll also do is look at Can you send it, the presentations? Sure, we can, we can send it to everyone. Uh -huh. They may not be able to open that PowerPoint. They, they can. He's got it in a PDF. Perfect. What we'll, what we'll also do is we'll make an opportunity and offer to meet individually with the other council members. Uh, as their time may allow to go over this, because I know it's a lot of information. It'd be very, very difficult, I think, if you just read the PowerPoint on your own to understand all the nuances associated with that. So we'll make an opportunity to meet individuals that at their time and that allows. Thank you very much for staying with us tonight.